Good evening, everyone. My name is Justin Clark. I am the political education co-chair for Central Indiana DSA. And tonight, we are so lucky to be doing a live Q&A with Bhaskar Sankara, who is the founder and editor of Jacobin Magazine. We are so happy to have him. Um, he launched Jacobin in 2010 as an undergraduate of George Washington University. And he's written for the New York Times, The Guardian, Vice, and The Washington Post. He's also the publisher of the UK-based Tribune, which is awesome. Their Instagram is also really great. Um, and Catalyst, which is a journal of theory and strategy, and he lives in New York. And we are sort of, we're doing this tonight as a cap off to our reading discussion group of the Socialist Manifesto, which is a book that we all really enjoyed and really learned a lot from and had really good discussions with about sort of the history and the theory and practice of socialism. So sort of the kind of the, the general thing tonight is we'll, I'll, give, I'll sort of open it up with some questions for Bashkar, and then we'll kind of throw it to the group. Um, and here, for those who are not sure, um, we use progressive stack. So in the chat, if you have a question, throw stack in the chat and we'll uh, kind of go through those as best as we can. Or you can always just say, hey, I have a question or use the little hand thing or whatever you'd like to do. Um, and uh, so without further ado, again, I just want to say thank you so much for joining us tonight, Bashkar. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. Thank you all for, for reading the book and, and for the opportunity to you know talk talk to everyone. I, I know, um, yeah, I, I know it's probably a different experience during a reading group like this over over Zoom, but you know, I'm still grateful for the, for the opportunity. Well, thank you. So we'll kind of get started with some of the folks here on our chat tonight have read the book and some are sort of new to you and sort of maybe new to your book. So we'll kind of have some broader questions to kind of get started. My first one for you is really, how did you get interested in socialism? Yeah, I was, um, well, I'm the youngest of five. I was only one of my family born in, in the United States. My, my parents came just a few months before I was born. And, um, you know, it was very clear to me from an early age how much of life outcomes were the result of accidents of birth. So obviously I had the advantage of uh, my siblings are much older, um, all except for one of them were, were much older. And it's not a huge surprise that like the three oldest ones didn't get the chance to go to college. And, you know, um, me and my sister who went through, you know, K through 12, basically in the US um, in good public school districts um, got that chance, uh, you know, both, or at least my dad um, kind of moved up in the American class ladder through uh, a public sector union job, which is still really, they're really common in New York. We have around 30, 33% union density in New York, uh, New York City, uh, which is just like not, it's not a thing anywhere else um, anymore, at least in, in the US. So um, yeah, it was very clear that accidents of birth dictate a lot of your, your outcomes, not aptitude or genetics or, you know, culture, because obviously my parents like, had basically the same culture in the home <laughs> from when I was growing up and five years earlier when they were in uh, Trinidad. So at the very least, I think that taught me the importance of um, of social goods and, and the impact that it could have on, on someone's um, life. And I would say that initial inclination was a broadly like social democratic, or at the time I would call it like liberal um, inclination. Um, and But that obviously also combined with um, you know, the Iraq war, which, which, which mattered and that polarized a lot of discontent at especially the Democratic Party for its, its role kind of going along with it, not being an opposition and just randomly picking up um, various works by Marxists. But I, I feel like my organic politicization was a broad, like left liberal, defend the welfare state, anti-war politicization. And then I randomly was intellectually interested in Marxism. And then when I discovered DSA kind of by chance, in my late teens, and I met with a few DSA members. Some of them are still around, like uh, Maria Swart is obviously our, our national director. Uh, I met with when maybe I was like 17, 18, David Duwalde and, and others. I kind of found a way to reconcile both ends of my politics, both the um, Marxist kind of like interest in that, in that those vague like historical um, questions but also day-to-day -day fights for things like, um, you know, I think my first protest was was probably with Maria and David on like defending, um, you know, some union solidarity thing in, in New York. It was like over some like kind of minor provision in a contract over healthcare, but you kind of get the importance of fighting for those little day-to-day -day things in the, but also why, you know, being a socialist and having the socialist worldview actually helps you not only 
you know, think about these broader historical dynamics and understand capitalism better, but also be better fighters for these, um, you know, immediate uh, demands. So yeah, I really grew up around uh, DSA and part of what I was trying to do with the book was just take all these bits and pieces of anecdotes and bit of history and whatever else and synthesize them together. So there could be a easy um, primer that doesn't really reinvent the wheel, but it like um, synthesizes things in the same um, place, uh, I think for an audience that might not necessarily kind of i would imagine my ideal reader would be someone who's like not particularly um definitely progressive likes bernie sanders or whatever else but might not, might not particularly get why what it means to be a socialist or why some of that stuff is is relevant as opposed to just you know the obvious relevant things like medicare for all right on and and uh to kind of and you kind of um anticipated my second question was what really inspired you to write the book. And I remember, I can't remember specifically which chapter, but you you began one, one of your chapters or one of the parts of your book with saying like, this is a book I thought I would write in my 50s. I ended up writing it in my like 20s or 30s. And here I am, I'm writing the book. Why am I writing it now? And I, I guess that was kind of be my question for you is kind of what inspired the moment for you to go ahead and write this book and get it out. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I think I wrote most of the book when I was 28. So I feel like there's things, I'm, I'm 31 now. So I feel like I've I'm grizzled, you know, I, somehow I feel like those, those years, uh, definitely you besides for 18 to 21, I think like 28 to 31, I think I'm like jaded and seen it all, you know, whatever else, three more miserable New York winters. Um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, again, a lot of what I was trying to do was to, um, get people to think not just about day-to-day -day politics, but about the wider historical context of what we're doing. So for example, when we think about what would happen, let's say Bernie Sanders actually won the, the presidency in, in 2020. So obviously I wrote this before 2020. So it, was, it seemed like an open possibility. And I think like a lot of the left was at the point where we would have seen any retreats as being like Sanders losing his will or his nerve, like in very like moralistic terms. And I think often a lot of criticisms of even politicians like AOC or, or local um, politicians, like there was a, you know, Harold Washington in Chicago or Mayor Dinkins who recently passed away, his experience in New York, like often this, 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 in order to understand it, you have to understand like history and broader, like uh, structural forces that come to bear on these on these experiments. So I think like, for example, understanding Sweden and both their successes, but also the pressures their project was under is really um, relevant. And also the same thing, um, you know, in a way to properly contextualize, like what was the Russian revolution? What was that context? What did they manage to accomplish? Why did they, did the revolution move down such an authoritarian path? Like to try to piece it together without simple um, moralizing. And I think, especially as American socialists, one thing we do really well is I think in our um, like homespun tradition, it is very moralistic in a good way often because it's, it's about talking about the inherent injustices around. And I think, I think part of that dates back to like 19th century traditions, like almost like left-wing evangelical traditions too, of talking about like, you know, man's law demands one uh, uh, thing, but God's law demands another. And I think there's a lot of power to that. I don't want to get away from that, like American populist uh, vernacular. And obviously, you know, when we talk about, you know, populism in America, it's been a left wing phenomenon. It, it hasn't been a right wing um, phenomenon historically. But I do think that also comes with certain shortcomings. And, um, and yeah, so I, I, I thought especially it was important to contextualize and also internationalize a lot of this, uh, these experiences. And obviously we're gonna have to invent a lot of things as we, we go along, but, um, but it seems to me that a lot of the dilemmas that we're dealing with or we're gonna deal with are dilemmas that other places have already dealt with because we're dealing with basically the same system with you know, unique particularities. So, you know, obviously if you're organizing against capitalism in India, you have to also add in the element of like underdevelopment or casteism or whatever else. And if you're organizing the US, you have to add in the, you know, 
various other developments and racism um, in, in the particular US forum and other stuff. But um, but yeah, a lot of the core of the system's uh, the same. So the lessons should apply. I love that. And that was the one thing I think that my our core group really liked about the book was the 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 really the importance of history. You know, and I'm actually, I, I'm a public historian by profession. Um, I work for the State Library and I digitize materials and and I, I find that the value of history is extremely important in sort of understanding where we are in socialism. Um, and I guess I just kind of wanted to follow up about that is like, why do you think history is so important for understanding sort of the struggle for socialism in the world? Yeah, I think for one, obviously this is a simplistic way to use and view, view um, history, but one thing that drew me to socialism was the sense that so many of the oppressions and different forms of exploitation that people take for granted um, in their own lifetime, like later are seen for what they are, which is, you know, unnecessarily, you know, violent and, and cruel. And I, I think as socialists who advocate and look forward to a world without forms of domination and, and oppression, um, it's useful to have that context. And also that means acknowledging victories while we, we have it, right? So in other words, we can't have a narrative of the United States in which it started off in sin and just stayed stayed there, um, because obviously we know, you know, the United States is is a place of still tremendous oppression, exploitation. But the reason why it's not the worst of all possible versions of the United States is because we have won substantial changes. You know, we have won um, a basic labor protections and basic legal recourses, and the end of um, at least formal legal segregation and the end of uh, slavery and the expansion of the franchise to uh, you know, non-property holders, non-white people, women, and, and, and so on. And I think that um, that should give us some inspiration that things can change, things can get better, but also it should give us a reminder that at every single turn, um, elites have resisted these change. Um, more often than not, like elites um, have benefited from existing social stratification. So, so they often actively uh, try to keep keep these um, structures in place. And other times, it just wasn't really in their interest to change anything or necessarily keep it the same. Um, but in either case, I think that um, we need to, to create a sort of narrative um, that involves and includes the left, because I think the, the left is often erased from American history, but we played a major role in basically every major progressive advance in this um, country since the first modern left, which you could say was the abolitionist movement of the 1840s, through the kind of populist and labor-led lefts of the, um, of the late 19th century, which includes kind of the, the socialist uh, tradition, a lot of which came out of the the populist movement, uh, then the left of the, the New Deal, the left of the civil rights movement and the broader um, rights uh, revolution and kind of um, and liberation movements of the 1960s uh, and, and onwards. So, um, you know, often we, we've been kind of in coalitions, sometimes in the as junior partners and coalitions with more moderate um, forces, which have kind of led things astray, and I think not given us the kind of gains we we wanted, but uh, the left has had a major role uh, to play. So at the same time that I wanted to like address head on some of the real crimes that have been committed in the name of, of um, socialism, I also want to, to remind people that at least in this country, we should be very proud of basically every part of the socialist tradition, uh, from the anarchist traditions of the um, late 19th century and the kind of uh, wobbly style like labor radicalism to uh, communist and socialist traditions and you know later on um, you know groups that had a myriad of different influences like um, the Black Panther Party was drawn to uh, Maoism and that didn't make them complicit in you know the the worst parts of, of, of Maoism and, and some of the experience in, in, in China but it did give them a another theoretical um, you know, basis to allow them to understand and combat forms of oppression uh, and exploitation in the, in the uh, US. So again, by kind of like talking about this history, 
and demystifying it, I think we could, um, it just makes it easier to, to tackle. And again, you know, I um, really came into the left with um, only a little bit of this, um, of this, this knowledge, you know, I, I, I picked up um, this to uh, like being curious about these past movements and experiences. I think some of it's useful, obviously some of it is like almost um, like useful to unlearn in the way that like if you're a creative writer or something, you start off when you're a kid writing very simple, clear and direct um, sentences and then somebody teaches you ad adverbs and then you end up writing with a lot of adverbs and, and you know, um, SAT vocab words and whatever else. And then obviously when you get better at writing, you figure out how to write shorter and clearer and, and without a lot of those words, but obviously you're not writing like you used to write when you're, uh, you know, in the fourth grade, it's still better because you're, you're figuring out subtle ways to, to communicate. I think that's often the experience that we need to go through as, um, as socialists and as as organizers, like we begin without really the framework and the tool set, then we get it, maybe we lean on it too heavily. But by the end, we end up as organizers who obviously spend most of our time asking people about their own experiences and their own lives and, and, you know, what's going on um, there, but we draw on on history and we draw on the theory uh, to to enrich that work. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, one book that left a huge impact on me when I was younger and, and was uh, was Howard Zinn's People History, People's History of the United States. That was a book that mm -hmm. always left a big impact on me. And and uh, and so, you know, there is there's there are alternate stories, you know, and, and, and I think finding those alternate stories are really good and kind of thinking through those complexities, which you do in the book. Um, and then I think in terms of thinking about strategy, you know, it may have been a couple of years ago, but I remember you you did this, um, I don't know if it was a debate, but you did a discussion with this guy named John Peterson from Socialist Revolution. It's like an IMT group. And I love this discussion because it was like these two different forms of like socialist strategy. And I obviously, I'm, I'm more in line with what you think um, because I think that his is the more sort of like, I don't know how to describe it, like Trotskyist, more sort of, doc, you know, more sort of like, and you were much more of like interested in like, well, here's how things really are. Here's what we can actually accomplish. Here's what things can. And I felt I felt like that was a very healthy discussion um, and I liked it. And so with that in mind, I was thinking a lot about like what kind of strategies should socialists embrace um, either to win power, to to what should they do in power and how they can do that to help improve people's lives? Yeah, I mean, I think that the left is is so weak that that. Well, first of all, I, th I think that our initial goal needs to be to implant ourselves deeper into a working class movement. I know a lot of us uh, come from working class backgrounds, but there's a difference between kind of recruiting and winning over working people in ones and twos and being really um, embedded. Um, like uh, when there was a huge strike in Lowell, Massachusetts, I think in 1913, I completely forgot what year, a, a general mass, a mass strike in, in, in Lowell, Massachusetts, the IWW organized, uh, something like 10,000 people in the town became IWW members. Um, it used to also be in other countries and other parts of the world. If you were from a certain area, like if you're from Bologna in Italy, or you engage in a certain trade, like you were an auto worker, it was assumed that because of your positionality, like like working class person from the city or whatever else, but you would be a leftist or you'd be associated with one of these two major um, parties because it was so much a part of your political culture. It was like, this is our avenue. This is our vehicle for getting our voices heard and getting our economic, political, social demands heard. It's through this vehicle of this party or this union or this, this way. And there's still little pockets of it left in the United States, but the left is really often at best we are just like a fragment of historical um, memory or we were up until um, recently in the sense that like um, like I often have wondered why certain like have you ever watched Inside Lewin Davis like no that, I've heard of it that, okay, I know well, it's like loosely that so the Coen brothers often do work like they've, they've often been fascinated with like left-wingers and communists and whatnot 
And I often found it really depressing because they were also fascinated with just like the like losers and mitzvahs of like American political life. And I feel like that's often that's what we were, but in a noble sense, right? So I don't I don't I mean that in like the full literary sense of like the um the you know kind of tragic and noble uh force that's been you know at times too pure for the world, whereas in other cases, other lefts uh, I think have um, because of historical conditions and circumstance, whatever ended up selling out some of their their small d democratic principles and others. Like, but we we have this this path of of you know purity and and um, and less um, and less relevance. But all that's to say that I think our immediate goal is to try to implant ourselves um, somewhere substantial, like in in the working class movement. And and my old conception of how we do it was a very traditional left wing one, which is we organize level at, uh, at the community level. So the obvious case there would be up tenants unions and other places where you're organizing people as renters, for example. Um, obviously workplace organizing is particularly important wherever possible. That's like a, our preferred way to organize people because whereas you're just, if you're just organizing people as voters or as citizens, you're, you're voting them, you're organizing them one by one of like a person with a vote. But if you organize a sector um, of the economy, you're organizing maybe a thousand people that could have the social weight to shut down a region's economy, you know, uh, could have, could exert that sort of uh, power. Um, so I still believe in that in the abstract. I think practically we have to look at the experience the last few years and say that um, electoral races have been our most direct and clear route to building power and popularity for our program. Um, there's, we have to do that, I think, in a way that doesn't fall into the trap of electoralism. Um, and I think there is a key difference um, there um, between you know, pursuing the shortcut of like, let's run these elections in order to build working class power and embed ourselves more in working class communities um, versus, um, let's win elections in order to elect a critical mass of um, DSA people to make the reforms to improve our, our, our lives. Um, and I'm not really against in the abstract the, the latter, but I, I see that I, I guess I compared to some people see it a little bit more um, instrumentally uh, how we uh, how we use these um, these races. Uh, but I think the bottom line is that our core message of, of economic egalitarianism, uh, racial justice, um, and just general a message that says that America is a country in which uh, a small group of people uh, are given the power to bully everyone else. Um, and that's not acceptable. I think that core message is still is widely popular and we just need to find a way to um, communicate um, that and and reach more and more uh, people. Great, right on, yeah. Um, so I guess my last question for you, and then we'll kind of open it up to everybody, is um, I recently watched a, a live stream that you did with Ben Burgess, where you guys were talking about a debate between, I guess, like Hitchens and some other guy and Ayn Rand people. Um, it was a very interesting conversation because I, I as somebody who came I actually like in college, I was like a nine rain libertarian. And then I kind of like, I kind of was in that whole world and left it. And so it's fun to kind of, but needless to say, I think in that discussion, you mentioned that you might've been working on something and I don't know how much you can say, but um, uh, is there another book in the works? Yeah, I'm actually working on two books, both of which have absolutely no commercial uh, viability. Like <laughs> I, um, like, so one of them is a book that is on the economics of a feasible um, socialism, basically. So it's talking about, well, what can we do to guarantee non-market rights, the rights to a good life um, through, you know, through the state um, and through planning of, I guess, in the really old language, you would call it the commanding heights of the economy. Um, you know, certain things like, for example, like looking at Texas, especially um, like our public utilities and grids should be just run by a democratic accountable um, a state. 
but then also uh, what would it look like to turn the rest of the economy over to uh, worker cooperatives? What are some of the dangers of that? Like, in, in other words, are we just creating a system of collective capitalism if we create just worker self-management in competitive workplaces? But what are the what are the different interplay between that decommodified state sector and that I think still has to be competitive uh, and largely market driven? Um, I guess you'd call it a private sector, this worker worker owned or worker control sector. What would it look like? So I'm working on on that. Um, and the other thing I'm working on is a history of the Grenadian Revolution with uh, one of the major participants in that revolution. So obviously that was from um, they took power in March 1979. We're in power since till um, October 1983. Uh, the U.S. invaded uh, October 25th, 1983. I think that it was a really significant experience. Um, it was, in a way, the last big outburst of that like long 60s, that like revolutionary uh, period that emerged in the 1960s and, and 70s. I think in the Caribbean context, you know, my, my family's from the Anglophone uh, Caribbean, they're from uh, Trinidad, but it was really um, one of the more significant um, acts since the Haitian Revolution. It was like the last significant revolution um, in, the, in the Anglophone world period, but I think uh, not just in the fight for, for socialism, um, uh, but also in the fight for uh, Black emancipation, it was uh, the continuation of the arc of the Haitian Revolution and the great uh, slave revolts. Like, what did it mean not just to win independence from from Britain, which was formerly won in Grenada in like '74, but to actually win um, economic self determination and social uh, self uh, determination? There was a lot of really interesting experimentation um, when it comes to different forms of of economic um, ownership. Um, you know, they were still a mixed economy that was actually quite like even the IMF and World Bank extended the line of credit to them in 1983 because they thought their macroeconomic foundations were solid, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, um, but also, yeah, they ended up in some turmoil Turmoil's for a variety of reasons. Um, I think in part, like they had a, um, you know, some tensions between they had a mandate and they had a democratic mandate from the time of their revolution, which was a popular revolution. They were planning to hold elections. They never ended up holding um, elections. Um, like they were, they were planned for 84, 85, um, which again, sounds like a very long time. I, I would like caution people to remember like the American revolution started in 1776 and the, the first real, real elections uh, didn't happen till, till like this, what, like, 1780s and the constitution wasn't ratified in 1787 or whatever um i should know the exact date. 1789 yeah 1789 okay yes um so um yeah in in either case you know i i think that um that we uh that what what ended up happening was like there was an extremely democratic party um, Maurice Bishop, the prime minister, lost the mandate briefly of their party, but didn't lose the mandate of the state. But there was no real avenue for like, how do you settle a dispute within a party when you're you have a party state? And there was a lot, lots of other interesting questions of of liberal democracy versus socialist democracy and the relationship between liberalism and socialism that came up. So I'm working on a book with one of the participants. Um, actually a former deputy prime minister of, of Grenada um, right now and, and some other other people who were involved in different sides of both that party dispute, but but at every stage of the, the revolution. So this is a book on Grenada that doesn't just focus on the US invasion. Um, but there is lots of interesting and cool stories, like even from little things of like how with basically an armed force of, uh, I'm not saying this is particularly relevant to our context, but an armed force of like 21 people, they they took out an army of around 1,200 um, through just like a bizarre kind of like shock and awe and like by confusing the army. Um, you know, I, I have like little stories from participants of how they smuggled small arms from the US um, in like giant tubs of Vaseline um and and brought it to Grenada so lots of like things that are like are you they could just talk about now because you know statutes of limitations and stuff are 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 um are up and a lot of them were 
uh, or some of them, uh, some of the people I'm actually working with were in jail until um, until recently, until about 10 years ago. So um, anyway, that's um, that to me is an important project and an interesting project, but um, it is not not uh, in the eyes of the world, I think, commercially viable. So that's more of a nights and weekends thing. That sounds wonderful, though. That sounds like a really great history because the way that, you know, often if you get, if you, like I've watched like the American experience in PBS and they talk about the Ray, you know, Reagan or whatever, and they sort of talk about Grenade as this sort of random one-off thing of like, you know, United States is getting out of its Vietnam syndrome. We're like, we're like flexing our muscles again. And like, that's mm-hmm. like the way that the narrative. So it's really good that there's gonna be something out there to sort of challenge that narrative. Yeah, yeah. And also one one weird thing too, is that uh, Thatcher was really against the invasion. So was the Queen of England, which is relevant because Grenada never declared itself a republic even after the revolution. Therefore it's nominal held a head of state was still a queen. So you have um, the US at, like and and Reagan and Thatcher going at each other's throats over the invasion of a small kind of communist one party <laughs> state, uh, which is um, yeah, it, it's it's like lots of lots of like weird kooky um, history. I mean, someone if anyone here is a documentarian, you know, you should contact me and make this into a documentary because because you know it's 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 interesting history and. Um, when they took power, a lot of the leadership was in their early 30s, um, late 20s or early 30s, I think was the medium age in their central committee. So they're still in their 70s. They're still sprightly. Um, but these are people who like talk about how like chatting with uh, Stokely Carmichael, Juan Maitore, talk, um, you know, uh, debating military strategy with Fidel and Raul Castro, um, arguing with like Brezhnev about something, you know, it just like they're in this like world that like Chris that like it's still within living memory but it seems like a eons ago yeah that would be an amazing I was thinking to myself this would sounds like an amazing documentary or some docudrama where they would you know um sign up mm-hmm. some kind of you know kind of fun movie to watch that sounds great well thank you for going through those sort of general questions our sort of formal part of this or whatever um I'd now like to open it up to everybody so basically if you all have a question um uh, throw a stack in the chat there and we'll kind of address them one by one um or you can just say hey I've got a question whatever and uh we'll get to as many as we can so anybody has a question go for it all right we'll go to Quinn first all right, yeah, thanks for coming tonight. My question for you is about your experience in the DSA and specifically what it's been like as someone who's been involved with the DSA for quite a while to see just this exponential growth over the last five years, especially. Um, what are some things that stand out to you, specific memories along the way? And, and maybe if you uh, could uh, sort of speculate about what, it, what the future looks like as well, I'd be interested in that too. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's it's a lot. Uh, sorry, should I take a few? Is it is it fine for me to just respond one by one? Yeah, yeah, we'll do it that way. That sounds yeah. great. Um, yeah, it's definitely like a whole new organization. It almost feels like I was a part of a completely different organization. Um, in the but obviously I, I now see it as very valuable because I do think that a handful of us that put a lot of like not especially me but like a, a lot of other people that put the effort into keeping it alive and like go doing these conventions when like a hundred people at most would, would show up or, you know, doing all these things of like keeping up an office. Um, like we, like I remember we couldn't afford like a water cooler. Like we, we would take our cups to like the um, like bathroom sink, <laughs> our, our mugs, because our budget was really um, strained. And, you know, that's, that's, we, we found every single hack to get around uh, to save, um, you know, to save a penny and and kind of keep it keep it going. So obviously, on the one hand, it's extremely validating. Obviously, it's a completely different organization, and I think DSA has just basically become um, a broad tent for like a revived left in the United States. Um, and I think that as as usual with most organizations, there's a probably a big gap between the general paper membership and the um, active layers. Um, but uh, I think it's definitely a, a, a starting point. Uh, I think it's definitely exciting. I mean, what I really want DSA to be is an organization that's like really easy to plug into and take part in. Um, 
And by that, I mean that I think it's easy to take part and plug into if you're a younger person, especially. I think it might be less easy to navigate the language and our structure of like different committees and things like that. If, if you aren't like, all, like my godmother, speaking of the Caribbean, my godmother is, is a Jamaican woman. She was like a manlyite, like that's her background. She still considers herself a lefty. She like Bernie Sanders, like she's uh, by now probably like 59, 60 years old. Um, I cannot imagine her, even though she's still like incredibly active and does a lot of stuff in her community. Um, like her going to a DSA general meeting in Brooklyn and like making great sense of it or knowing how to participate. Um, unless of course she, she met with an organizer. Like I, I, we have lots of great organizers who have a one-on-one -on -one with her and direct her like to like, you know, a housing group or, or was, you know, it's kind of some other working group that's going on. But I, I do feel like what we're missing is obviously that embeddedness and that, um, and ways to both like have a disciplined outward appearance and also harness all the resources without becoming a stultifying kind of organization. Um, so it's very hard. Yeah, it's hard to know what the exact route is because also if you become too coherent or too structured in a certain way, you might actually break apart. Like I think DSA is basically indestructible <laughs> at this point because of how flexible and loose it is. So I, I think that's both a strength and a weakness. And we saw with the experience of students for, with the Democratic Society in the 1960s, what happens when you take a very loose and unstructured organization, you try to turn it into a more disciplined, like super hardcore Marxist, like cadre organization that did not, not end well. So uh, yeah, I kind of, I kind of think that that DSA is probably not going to be the organization that will change the United States, but will probably be the organization that feeds into um, the current, which will probably be broader and might even use a different kind of more left populist idiom or, or, or something else like that, um, that does uh, change the, the United States. I think we just have to be, you know, keep, keep on doing what we're doing and, and you know, reach a, a wider layer of people and, and both do important work that takes advantage of the opportunities we have in front of us and also not burn out. Um, so yeah, we're, we're, I, I have no definitive answers, but I do see the, the tight rope that we're walk, walking. That's great. And I know just even from my experience when the, when the Bernie Sanders campaign ended, I was sort of figuring out, okay, what am I gonna do now? And I had sort of two choices and one was join DSA and the other one was joining something that was based out of Britain, but it's kind of all over the world called the International Marxist Tendency, just like a Trotsky, it's outshoot. And I just kind of studied both of them and kind of figured them out. I'm like, nope, DSA is the place for me because it's this big umbrella. I sort of see myself as very non-doctrinaire on the left. I identify as a socialist, but I don't have like, I'm not like a very specific thing. And I like that about DSA. I like that kind of exchange of ideas and that openness. And I think that's really good for the left. Um, so uh, we'll shoot it to Jesse. Sure, thanks. Uh, really appreciate all your insights so far. Uh, I know a lot of us really enjoyed reading the book and one thing you know, that you kind of hit home over and over again in a good way was the need for leftists to both win short-term gains for worker, working people, you know, like do fight for the small minimum wage increase. You know, don't just say, well, under communism, you know, we won't have to worry about wages, so let's not get involved in that fight. Uh, and I think that's great. Uh, and like you said, just mentioned, it kind of aligns us with the left populist short-term goals, which is awesome. Um, sorry, I'm struggling to enunciate my question here. I think we saw beginnings of it with the Tea Party, and then obviously, like Trump is a huge manifestation of this right-wing, even if it's kind of astroturfed populism. You know, I. I argue that it's not really nearly as populist as it presents itself, but how much worry do you have that um, this kind of right-wing populism will co-opt and, and take the fire out of the burgeoning left populism we're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely concerned about, I would say I am not that concerned that we're gonna see a right-wing populism in the US emerge because I think they've had every opportunity to build one. But it is so like their contempt, like even Trump's contempt, for example, this like supposed to, supposedly populist figures contempt for his own base, like complaining that the people, you know, that he hoodwinked into storming the Capitol 
um, form where like looked low class or whatever, I think defines a lot about the so-called, you know, populism in the US. I think there's still the theoretical possibility of some sort of like Bannonite um, formation, but I don't see it in this current configuration of the, the right. Like, I don't see who's going to push that forward. I do think there's always a danger of the, the far right. I think globally, especially, it's going to be a big problem in part because climate change and other other things will create I think an environment of, of scarcity and that's the environment in which the right really prospers. So if you look at like, even during the Trump years, if you look at Americans' perception of immigration and other things, um, Americans actually were far more progressive on issues of immigration on the whole than they were, let's say in the 1990s. Um, but it only takes a little something for people to freak out and for that to embolden the right. So. Like, obviously, for example, like 9-11 was like a big, like a tragedy, a human tragedy, thousands of people died and whatever else. But in the scale of a country the size of the United States, like the work of an isolated couple dozen um, terrorists um, demolishing, uh, you know, attacking a couple buildings, like that was used to, to what, justify invasions of two countries and operations on every continent on earth and, and whatever else. And I'm afraid in the same way that a refugee crisis is like provoked by by climate change or exasperated by climate ch climate change will be used to to foster um, a climate of of just ex extreme um, uh, will just a very belligerent uh, climate that that benefits the the right and then obviously our task is so much harder than the task of the right because fundamentally they're trying to organize. Uh, capitalism a little bit differently, largely in the interests of capitalists. Um, whereas we're trying to organize um, workers against the, the system. We have to deal with a million different collective action uh, problems. And um, yeah, so it seems to me that even though I'm maybe compared to some people on the left, my analysis is not that we are moving down the road of, of fascism um, or that the far right is about to take power. I think at the very least, we have the threat of a small far right causing chaos and disruption and hurting people like they did in the 1990s. Um, and also you have the potential of um, just in general a political climate where those preaching xenophobia and nativism uh, have the upper hand the world over. And in a weird way, when um, liberal democracy has been ascendant when the dreams of, of prosperity and and progress have done well the left hasn't totally been you know vanquished like in the 60s and 70s we had some great decades for worker organizing because people felt like the pie was was growing and they deserved a bigger piece of that pie because their labor made it work um but during the 70s and 80s and 90s a lot of those same people felt like the pie was shrinking and they were just really concerned that um, that black Americans were getting too much of it or that, you know, immigrants were getting too much of it or whatever, whatever else. And I, I do fear another moment of, of scarcity. And that's one reason why, you know, I think the Biden administration is going to going to fail, but I'm not actively rooting for their total collapse because I, I feel like the right is better positioned to benefit from, from it than the, than the left at the moment. Um, and I just wanted to mention, I said this in the chat as well, but those who want to type their questions, they don't want to, they don't, they would like to just chat that they type them in there. They're free to do that. Um, but until then, we're going to shoot it to Alejandro. Hey, sorry. Um, so, uh, I was introduced to your work, um, my, I guess my path, one of my paths to leftism was uh, through Big Waz, Wozni Lambre. Um, oh yeah, he's a good friend Count of the mine. Ding. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've gone to a couple of their live shows, and I don't. He wouldn't remember me. He was always too drunk to. But yeah, um, different, <laughs> different story. Um, so then, kind of Michael Brooks, and uh, um, you know, and then I was introduced to more formal writers and more formal kind of academic leftists and um, reading more long form leftist articles and stuff. 
le leading me to the uh, Jacobin. Um, but it was, I would say it was not destined that I was going to make that transition. I was always considered like a, I considered myself more progressive than progressive Democrats, but I didn't really see a law, uh, a full logic in socialism. Um, and it, I, I would have not read up on these things and become a socialist if it wasn't for someone who made it funny and fun. Um, and I'm kind of wondering how can you, or how do you see us being able to um, make socialism or leftism more palatable for someone who is looking more for a joke or a laugh um, at first, but is, you know, open to those ideas and kind of lead more people down this path who would be considered normies? Yeah, well, I think there's two different um, things. So one is obviously, um, Right now, I think DSA has actually done a good job in the sense of um, reaching a certain layer of like, like young people, like I think tapping into a certain cultural sentiment. Um, but we are still largely a, so on the one hand, we are able to reach, I think some of those, those people. Um, but on the other hand, when it comes to reaching like a much broader public, um, like ordinary working class people who are fed up, I think that we still have a ways to go. And the way I would describe it is um, often what the emerging left is in the US is it's in like creating a, a discourse and it's positioning itself as part of what you would call like a producerist like rhetorics. In other words, the rhetoric is those who work for a living versus those who just own like wealth. So like the 99% versus the 1% which is totally fine, I think, as a, as a rhetoric and it encapsulates a lot of people. It encapsulates, you know, professionals just getting by, earning like 50, 60 grand a year. And, you know, it also encapsulates like the broad working class and low level supervisory employees and um, whatever else. And I think like that broad vernacular is OK, but it does mean that we're kind of we do elide the fact that we're largely a middle class uh, movement and organization. And by middle class, I just, again, don't mean like the composition of everyone. I mean, like how we come to it and how we're politicized. I think we all have, again, very interesting, like random stories, much like my own story of like how we, we came to the left. But I think it's like fairly telling that um, I have actually been a unionized employee in various ways, like most of my, my, my life um, until like the last, well, I guess not most of my life now. Yeah, most of my working life is still 50 50. I've been like just a left wing publisher full time for like the last like four or five years. It just feels like feels like less. But but it was always clear that my like class trajectory was different, right? Because I was um, getting college educated or I was like just finished with college. So even though I was like working a part time job as a college secretary or even doing like like all this various like odd jobs in, in New York City, like I was just doing this like to earn a little bit of money on the side or whatever else. But long story short, I think that the that often uh, what we miss is that even though this broad alliance is fine, what we want is a working class movement that can incorporate a lot of these other people, like white collar professionals and other people who just out of their own moral inclinations are coming to the to the to the left or who are getting like squeezed and then coming to the to the left. Um, and what it'll take to win over a lot of those people is we actually have to deliver the goods. And often we obscure the reasons why, let's say, a lot of black and brown people keep voting for the Democratic Party. Well, the Democratic Party is a source is source of power and patronage. And even if it's limited progress, it's still progress in a lot of a lot of areas. Like why did Clyburn have so much power in South Carolina? Well, he actually has delivered the goods, even in like a very narrow, incomplete form that we would criticize for a lot of his constituents. Um, and also just in general for for black voters in an area where which is where in which they've been one of the most hyper exploited minorities in the history of the, the world, you know, in in uh, South Carolina, 
while actually having a party that foregrounds its uh, black leadership in the, at the state level and elects um, local officials and whatever else is in terms of like the scope of history, like a major achievement for a black civil society. So I'm not saying we have to create contending like vehicles of patronage, but I'm saying that like, we have to, I think, be associated with a major victory, like a nationwide $15 minimum wage driven by the left, like Medicare for all, like something really big that we could claim this is what happens when you elect, elect left-wing leaders and you support left-wing social movements. So that's what I mean by chicken or the egg scenario where for most people, collective action really doesn't make sense. Like it's not a logical response. Um, if you are about to lose your job or you're currently unemployed, it is not logical for you to pursue politics as a way to improve your lives. It's far more logical for you to like find a side hustle or go to your kinship networks, go to your friends or family for some kind of support while you rebound or, you know, whatever, whatever you do when you hit a hard time, like it's a lot, like much more of a straightforward um, uh, path. So obviously we have to create the conditions in which politics seems viable. And it seems like something that people can and should do uh, when they're, when they're in a, in a bind. And, um, and yeah, that just means creating these these infrastructures of dissent, like creating militant um, unions where we have the U.S. workforces, creating you know tenant associations, um, putting forward I think left wing leaders uh, through through election campaigns, whether we win or lose, that can speak to these um, these uh, concerns. Like I think we shouldn't be afraid of of leadership. And like spokespeople, like obviously, if you just pursue that alone, you fall into certain populist traps. And we're we're not trying to create like a populist movement where we just have a leader that's going to solve everything for us. But it is true that people like are looking for spokespeople. They're looking for someone to galvanize around, and that's what that's what Bernie was. And I think um, you know that's what we need at the local level. We need um, you know politicians that are actually accountable to their constituents, but um, can be spokespeople for for a different sort of politics that that blames you know millionaires and billionaires for um, uh, and not ordinary people for for the the, the stress they're, that they're under. But yeah, it's often like a chicken or the egg uh, problem. That's why I invest a lot of effort and hopes in the Bernie campaign, because I did think that it was a potential shortcut for us to like, like find a shortcut to take power, use the bully pulpit to like make a few changes, and then use that base to like build from the grassroots, kind of reverse engineer the the, the process, um, you know, speed up just like uh, what will be a very, very long process. And, and obviously, now we're back to a slower path for change. But I don't think we can give up the opportunity to let's say, have like, let's convince a union leader to run in the Democratic primary in 2024 with some outsider, like left wing rhetoric. Like, I don't think we can. And obviously, that doesn't mean we, sh we stop everything else we're doing when we're doing that. But I don't think we can, we can miss those opportunities. And I'm definitely like, like, um, I don't have that many answers. I just know we need to throw shit at the wall and, and just, you know, see what what sticks. So we're going to throw it now to Hannah with her question. Hi there. Thank you so much uh, for all your thoughts. They're all really awesome. I'm learning a lot. Um, I guess my question to you is, since we have in the past few years especially had some people that would, I guess, theoretically, not necessarily in my opinion, be leftist um, social media-esque politicians. Um, my question to you is like, in what ways like do we, does an organization like DSA like hold them accountable? I mean, at like what point do you want to pull out from them being your spokesperson? And it, like, how do you see viable paths for us actually being, for um, any organization to encourage them to actually talk about DSA as an organization? Because right now, like, pushing politicians who then don't discuss the organization or any socialist causes doesn't really seem, even if they are like Medicare for all without saying certain things, it doesn't necessarily seem 
I don't know. That's my yeah, question. Yeah, no, like, I, how I, do I, you hold I, them accountable? Yeah, I totally get what you're saying. I mean, I think there are certain politicians at the local level that have been really useful building uh, DSA and more broadly building a progressive movement. I think we have to avoid just, and I'm not saying you're saying this, but I think in general, we have to avoid the sectarian trap of just saying, um, we want them to build DSA the way that let's say, um, I'll use Sama Sawant because, you know, I, I like her and I'm doing fundraising all, all month for her campaign, but like a lot of like her platform, when she talks about building left is about like social alternative, build social alternative and whatnot. I think DSA is like structured differently. Um, uh, in part, uh, in both to both our detriment and to our strength, we're just like a looser um, thing. So your your membership, your identification with it is going to be looser, even if you're a super active member. Much less if you're just a paper member who gets an endorsement and then goes on to win a race. So I think we primarily the thing that I'm looking for is not necessarily well well whether they're building socialism as a movement or socialist organizations as such, but whether they're pushing the class struggle and they're building a broader working class uh, movement. So certain of our elected officials like Julia Salazar in uh, New York or Carlos, Carlos Rosa and others in, in Chicago do actually build DSA. They feel a closer tie to DSA and they, they have been building it. Other politicians, I think like, um, Jamal Bowman or, or, or others, I think, who might be nominal paper DSA members, but have never been that associated with the organization, I think are fine because they're they're building a broader uh, working class movement and they're they're um, advancing the class struggle in some um, in some way. But fundamentally, when it comes to politicians like, let's say, AOC, um, the key thing to remember is that we don't actually have much leverage or power over them. Um, we, uh, at this point, like aren't that necessary for them to, um, to win re-election and they're in safe blue states, uh, states and they have their tremendous, their own, um, profile as is, but what they have and what we want is not necessarily their allegiance. We don't necessarily like want them. We want their constituents. Like, they actually have a platform where they can reach millions of working class people. So my my general stance is kind of playing nice out of a real politique of DSA doesn't really have another choice. We can't withhold or discipline them. Um, we could probably best influence them at this moment by playing uh, nice and uh, we do want access through the bully pulpit to the to the millions of working class people that do listen to them. Now, obviously, in extreme cases, not like if someone doesn't push hard enough on this thing, but in extreme cases, if someone votes for a war or votes for austerity or whatnot, then you just have to go all out no matter what the cost and and really try to primary and try to replace them and then hopefully tarnish their reputation enough that they, you know, they're they're slugging it out, you know, in in this in this in this way, uh, which might diminish their ability to run for higher office or their prestige in the the national sense or whatnot. I think that's the real power we have, but it's that that kind of nuclear option that um, I'm not sure really serves us um, that well. But this is one of the reasons why I think we we need something a little bit more structured than our existing endorsement process. I'm not sure what that would look like. Um, often some people like Jared, Jared Abbott and Jacobin has written about the idea of a party surrogate. So essentially like what would it take to take our existing network of progressives and future people we endorse, but actually hold them to, to a still fairly loose, but a tighter platform and to, um, you could only take certain uh, sources of funding and yada, yada, yada. So, so I do think we need something a little bit tighter when it comes to our electeds, but we can't overplay our our hand um, because I don't think it's super strong yet. Okay, we'll go to Peter. Thanks, Justin. Um, so a bit larger, longer term theoretical kind of question. Um, have you run across anyone doing the political theoretic work to figure out how to replace the United States Constitution, the United States government with X? Um, 
if you haven't, do you know of people who are kind of like working on that? Because um, this is a vanity question. I've had an idea and I'm not sure how stupid it is. And I'd like people to talk to. So replace it with what? Exactly. Okay. So, I mean, in general, I guess, like, if you're asking more broadly, like, how socialists have conceived of, like, the political structure um, after after capitalism, I would say it's, it's very underdeveloped. Like, normally people just say vague stuff about, like, Soviet democracy. By that, they mean, like, direct democracy or council democracy or whatnot. But it's often, like... I think we need to think broadly about what it would take to democratize our political sphere. And I think some mix of both greater direct democracy and also more responsive representative democracy, I don't think it has to be one or the other, uh, definitely makes sense. I think a lot of the existing US constitution is set up as essentially a charter for plutocracy, which is what it's what it's done very well for, for many years. Probably the greatest constitution out there um, that I know of, at least, that at least implemented um, is is the 1994 um, South African uh, Constitution, and that obviously guarantees a lot of positive rights. Um, but fundamentally, it's more just a question of um, our existing power. It's the same way in which, yes, I mean, I'm actually spending all this time writing a book about, um, you know, what a feasible five minutes after capitalism, you know, socialism could look like, but fundamentally the reason why these questions aren't that um that um you know talked about is because we don't even have the class power to win like basic dignity for for ordinary people uh, basic you know food shelter housing healthcare like um like we have we have Americans like uh, literally freezing to death in this country and thousands homeless and ugly. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, it doesn't mean that these broader questions aren't that, that valid, but I think that um, they will become more relevant and more important as we um, advance in our process of winning economic um, uh, justice and dignity for, for people. And right now, just we're so far out of having the, the power to, um, to make it, uh, to make it happen. I think we should be a little bit wary of just spending too much time, I'm not saying you're doing this, by the way, at all, but spending too much time thinking um, and blueprinting out future forms, uh, rather than participating in the day to day struggle that will empower the public, which will then in their own democratic ways decide those future forms. So in a in a different context, Marx talked and critiqued uh, utopian socialists for writing recipes for the cookshops of the future. And in part, what he meant was that if socialism is this mass democratic act that that um, comes about in you know different conditions and, and, and environment, uh, it's kind of hard to a priori write a reality that then reality will have to conform to instead of seeing um, the new forms as as coming out of um, existing forms of um, of struggle in the future. Right, and if I may just jump in quickly, um, why I ask is my vision for DSA, um, given that I've gotten heavily involved in our chapter is, um, you know, I'd love to have some form we could look at to begin building towards such that I mean, in the kind of dual power mode, um, we essentially, you know, build out an organization that's just so amazing that eventually it just gobbles everything up. Everyone just freely joins it. Um, so I've been interested to kind of hear what others have been thinking are kind of the best structures to organize, to create within DSA um, such that it reflects our values. It's highly democratic in all the best ways. And when people get in, they, you know, stuff clicks and they're like, oh yeah, no, this is exactly what we need. Um, and either we reform the system or we replace it with something we're already building towards. Thank you. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention, I put it in the chat here, um, Jackman recently republished one of Eugene V. Debs' essays on why we've outgrown the US Constitution. It's really fun to read and it's kind of remarkable how like well over hundred years later, how really on point Debs is, um, I mean, that's because Debs is awesome. I have a poster of Debs behind me, like 
he's the man. Like he's a big part of my own, like, you know, and, and, and I take a lot of pride in the fact that he's a Hoosier, which is something I, you know, I know like, like, you know, like parochialisms are a problem sometimes, but like, I'm very proud of the fact that he's a Hoosier. I think that's great considering yeah, our you, reputation. You, you should be. Yeah. Julius, um, Julius Wayland, um, the uh, person who started appeal to, to reason and like uh, help, help build the, the socialist party is also, I think from, from Indiana. There's a lot of radicalism here. People don't really realize like my one thing you talked really eloquently earlier about sort of the, the sort of religious elements of sort of radicalism. My graduate research focused on free thought. And so I wrote about people like Robert Ingersoll and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and all these sort of radical free thought leaders who had maybe not socialist politics, but they definitely had sort of left of center politics and were definitely more radical. and. And, uh, and uh, Ingersoll was one of Debs's friends. And, and, and so like when Debs, when uh, Ingersoll passed away in 1899, Debs was at his funeral and spoke and talked about how wonderful he was. And it's just, it's kind of, uh, there's a lot of that. And, and Ingersoll was from Illinois. Like the Midwest has this like revolutionary like legacy that often gets lost because we always get talked about as if like we're just all right wingers. So that's why I love Debs. Sorry for the digression, but yeah, definitely check out that. Um, article there that they was republished in Jacobin. We're going to now shoot it to Paul. All right, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about goals. So, you know, we're we're still kind of in the early stages. This is kind of the opposite of, of Peter's kind of question, but you know, what's been your experience with in process for setting goals at a chapter level? And do you think there's kind of one low-hanging fruit or or what are some examples of low-hanging fruit where we could achieve it and then it could be something to rally around and say, hey, we achieved this. It's not, we didn't get Medicare for all, but it did something to help, you know, progress us. Yeah, I mean, well, I think at the at the chapter level um, without being, so, so you don't want to be an organization that spends all your time. Like I was once a member of a socialist uh, group or um, that spent most of its time deciding like what the minutes for the next meeting were kind of like you spend all your time internally um building just internally right um but often i think for dsa at least because we come from environments where we reject more sectarian forms of organizing we don't pay enough attention on like targets like membership recruitment or like like other other things like that that actually do do matter, especially um, to the balance is obviously like spending enough time and energy um, growing uh, growing the thing and having a single matrix for success. So you start with the basic metric of like, well, how many people do we have signed up for DSA? Uh, then we could get more advanced about what percentage of the membership are showing up at least once every six months for a meeting. And I know you're probably already already doing that, but it's like a simple we're not doing well that. defined okay well i think i think a simple now we well are as of today goal. yeah yeah no so so in other words like it's almost like the most basic form of like any organization like and this applies to like activism it applies to like business it applies to like sports or whatever you find like one basic um like number that you you shoot for um and i think honestly like membership number of members uh makes sense and again the reason why i used to hate doing i used to hate like ever telling someone to join dsa because it just seemed like weird or sectarian it seems like something you do when you're in like a cult or whatever but because dsa is a broad based pretty all things considered normal and friendly non-sectarian space i think we're we're fine with bringing other people in it like let's encourage people who are fed up and who might have liked bernie or like aoc or like like broadly our our agenda to to join and 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 take part i think getting people in the room is the most important thing because if you have a large enough critical base in your membership then you could really figure out how to do breakouts and then how to set like okay a priority of um you know our chapter priority is you know medicare for all or it's housing or whatever but you know um but yeah i, I think that uh, then after that it's um, engagement of paper members. And that gives you basically two lists to go after. Like one, the list that you're expanding of your, of your overall membership. And then also the list of like people who are current or lapsed members, like how can you engage them around an issue 
Um, and then a lot of that relies on just keeping data. Like I remember I was an intern, well, I was an intern at DSA or like a volunteer at DSA in the, 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 the summer. Um, that's a fancy way of saying I wasn't paid, but it's, it's all right. It was, it was political activism. Um, of um, like a lot of my job is like data entry, but like very particular data entry of like, okay, I have to not just fill in all the names from all these signup sheets we got over the course of the year, but like note, um, you know, what what uh, type of event it was at and whatnot. And then essentially we would treat them the same way that probably if you were in sales, you would treat like people when you plug them into like a customer relationship manager, except our ask is to, you know, help participate in the process of self-emancipation you know, or whatever, instead of, uh, instead of help, you know, you know, buy these knives or whatever. So yeah, all, all that's to say, I, I think I think a lot of that's pretty basic. We need members, we need people who to push for things. And we also, obviously, at the same time that we're concerned with building our organization, we can't be um, sectarian and we can't be afraid to work with people who don't really want to join a socialist group, but who believe in the broader agenda. We, we, we're obviously pushing for not just the growth of socialism. So socialism becomes more popular, but we're pushing for a working class agenda. We think being socialist helps us as tribunes of this this working class um, agenda, but if anything in general, DSA like we veer to the side of being like too like let's just do the behind the scenes work as DSA and not trumpet the word DSA. And uh, I think it's it's totally okay for us to be out in the open as as democratic socialists and to tell people that it's it's like a worthwhile sacrifice to um, you know spend uh, five dollars a month and and support um, this this movement. Thank you. Okay, um, I'm going to now send it to. You know. So there, there was one question that just came into the, the chat. Yeah, we'll do the chat then. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Um, this is from uh, Nama Luba. Um, and, and he is asking, have you seen Judas and the Black Messiah? Regardless, how do you feel about portrayals of socialism in its history and media with how easy it is for message to be lost or intentionally distorted on the large commercial scale? Is it worth it to support films and other popular media about socialism? Like would a movie, would a Debs movie be done well? Mm -hmm. I watched Judas as a socialist and enjoyed seeing her history, but I wondered if it was a visible way, a viable way rather, to educate more people about the history of socialism in the US. Yeah, so I haven't actually seen it yet. I wanna, I wanna see it. Um, and yeah, I was slightly, um, yeah, slightly worried that obviously it would um, like lose some of its political content. Content obviously Hampton was like a deeply political person and often like that gets lost when people talk about the Panthers and like just the, the aesthetics of like of like resistance rather than like the actual substance and for someone especially his age just incredibly like serious like sophisticated thinker like if anyone wants to see something just like incredible like it's him at like 19 or 20 years old denouncing the weather underground like in a speech and he's like denouncing their petty bourgeois behavior and whatever else um you can tell this is just like a very very confident very smart person obviously i uh, was on on pace to be one of our are great leaders and and that's one reason why he was he was killed um but yeah i think in general i'm i'm someone who who does not um fear um co-optation in part because the left's real danger has been just total uh irrelevance and being erased from from u.s history so um you know i draw the line at like mother jones being called mother jones <laughs> i think that's like a great a great outrage but other than that you know um i think that um yeah it would be great if we if we had a deb's movie that'd be that'd be great um obviously you know putting these these things together is is, is hard like i'm i'm actually um trying to to push through like a few um left-wing um stories through um through um film like mostly just through like uh, taking, um, you know, trying to develop and, and package stuff and, and hand it to uh, left-wing people, like uh, one of the Jackman hosts, Nando Vila, works in, works in Hollywood, but 
yeah, it's very hard because even there's a lot of left wing individuals in, in, in Hollywood, like almost nothing, almost no ideas actually end up getting made. <laughs> like, uh, and if they do end up getting made, like, you know, they look for the easiest sort of story, like Warren Beatty, even when he was like at the peak of his power, like one of the most famous uh, people in Hollywood, like had to like finance and agree to star in and direct uh, Reds to get it um, made. And that actually is a, is a really nice story that does capture a lot of John Reed's politics, but it had to be shoehorned into like a romance and a tale about like American idealism or whatever else. But yeah, in general, I'm not, I don't think we should be afraid of, um, of, of, of co-optation in that, that sense. Um, you know, we should be afraid of, um, again, like, succumbing to certain structural pressures once we're in positions of power. And that's the way I like to put it, because I think almost no one thinks that they're selling out when they're selling out. They think that they're um, achieving good things um, uh, and making compromises to help their base when they're selling out. Like, it's very rare. They do exist. Like, it's very rare, though, that you find people who are directly, directly corrupt. Like, even the history of, like, actual corruption in left-wing parties like overseas and, and elsewhere have often been like people taking bribes to fund their party or an electoral campaign like it's often not in our culture of like direct personal grift and, and and things like that so anyway all that's to say that at the moment i think um like um us getting uh, subsumed by a broader uh, liberalism or becoming totally sectarian and becoming like a little subculture and a broader progressive left is a bigger danger than than co-optation. So if Hollywood wants to make, you know, a Debs movie or whatever, we will um, positively review it. <laughs> One movie that I really liked within the last couple of years that's sort of a left-wing movie um, that we watched as a part of um, our Marx reading group was The Young Karl Marx, um, mm -hmm. which is a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to watch. It's just kind of cool to see Marx as a person which is, I think, kind of, because a lot of times you see him, he's got the long beard, you know, he's kind of mythical in a lot of ways when you see him in photographs. I compare him a lot to Lincoln in that regard, but to see him, like, kind of, like, hanging around and getting drunk with Bengals and, like, being a person is kind of cool. Um, also, just the scene of him reading, um, like, about the labor theory of value in English for the first time is, like, an amazing scene. It's, like, set mm -hmm. to music, and it's, like, you know, well done, making uh some Mm -hmm. Yeah, make, make, uh, someone with reading, just reading a sentence, you've made that cinematic. So, um, John, we're going to circle back to you or whoever has their final question. And this, I think, will probably be our last question for the evening before we finish up. All right. Hello. Thank you. I have the honor of the final question, I guess. Um, so my question is, I live, I mean, in Indiana, it's generally pretty rural, but I live in an especially rural area. Um, and I was wondering if you personally had any advice or you had some uh, resources or tips for how um, us as DSA members can reach out and build uh, membership in rural areas. I know that's a big challenge for the DSA in general, so. Yeah, to be honest, I, I, uh, I don't really have any particular advice other than I would say that so much of our strength has been through um, national politics. And, and I think so much of politics right now is, is national through like, so let's say some, through something like the Bernie Sanders campaign. We were talking about issues that impacted every single corner of the country, rural or urban, um, impacted workers of all races, impacted, you know, like everywhere. And um, I think that can't be the end of our organizing. Obviously, we have to tailor a particular organizing to, to different areas and, and different issues and impact like a working class that's spread across an entire you know, continent, um, really. Um, but we're basically at the stage now where we are going to um, get most of our strength and most of our growth through these big national patterns. And I think that's a general trend of politics worldwide, where even in countries that used to have a very different style and culture of debate, it was like much more local, much more like parliamentary, much more like, um, like in working class politics, for example, in a lot of these like traditional labor parties, like every single like large tenement building would have like a block captain 
for the party to like whip the vote and whatever else. Like a lot of those structures have decayed and they're gone. And I think to some degree we have to rebuild that, but often it starts with national politics. And uh, then from that strength, once we have a big galvanizing national event and we reach people totally randomly, like through the internet, through a million different forms, we then need to take that very soft affiliation. Like, oh, I like AOC, I like Bernie, I like this, I like DSA and then turn it into a hard bond. And that's what we do when we funnel them them down. So um, you know better than me, you know, I should ask you like where you live, like what the big issue is and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but I would say that a lot of the divides that are pushed um, are often divides that are, are pushed just in the cultural sphere and the media and politicians, uh, because like, I think we all obviously, we know that um, there's like lots of just um you know misery and, and suffering and oppression in you know rural areas just like there is in, in in urban areas and we're peddled obviously you know a culture war line that pits us against each other but um you know a lot of the same demands uh work in both both places um i would, I would guess there's particular challenging challenges when it comes to things like canvassing um or things like running an electoral race where you have to just cover so much more ground um and i think logistically that might make it a lot uh different and a lot more difficult like we've had a lot of success in new york city like we can knock on every door with a bunch of volunteers that are just walking around with clipboards or with an app you know on their on their phone we could we could hit up like thousands and thousands of doors in one day like that's that's going to be different in the different districts but i i feel like that's more like a tactical challenge than a strategic challenge that i could really from afar give any advice on Thank you. So, Lucas, did you have a quick question? Maybe we could do a quick question, Lucas, if you can. If you can't, that's okay. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was wondering what your opinion on mutual aid as an organizing tactic is. That if that is a moral organizing tactic or a good one. What's your feeling about that? Yeah, I'm somewhat contrarian in the sense that I think a lot of people broadly speaking, I don't want to speak to for, for other people, but in the in the Jacobin milieu might be much more skeptical of it as an organizing tactic, uh, to be frank. For me, I think the most important thing is figuring out how to embed ourselves in um, in the working class. And I often don't think of it as a zero sum game. And that I think that if there's a bunch of people who want to do a mutual aid um, thing, um, uh chances are even though in the abstract they're taking away energy that could be going to like canvassing for x or y like in the day-to-day -day reality of how dsa functions they're just putting more energy that wouldn't otherwise be in there into this other thing um so the way i would put it is that in the abstract i think some of the existing tactics of, of mutual aid that dsa has pursued like the black break light uh break light uh clinic are not the best use of our finite resources, but concretely, I don't think it does really any any harm. And I do think that building a working class movement, at least part of it, is um, is is involves politicized social service work. I think this politicized social service work is better done by a mass party than a small organization. So if you actually think about, like, often, for example, when we think about the Panthers, we think about their um, the uh, free breakfast program and the way that was used uh, as both a tool of propaganda, but also a tool to concretely improve and help people and embed themselves in communities. This was done at a time that when they were a much larger um, group and it was done by a group that I think really understood how to use and utilize the media and utilize like the propagandistic effect of what they were doing a little bit differently and a group that was like already better, better embedded. In the abstract, I'm not against it. I think if you want to look at some successful examples of it being tied to political struggle, look at the solidarity networks in Greece. Um, and um, so, yeah, I'm I kind of I don't want to seem like I'm wishy washy. I'm taking both positions, but I don't want to come down hard. I think it's probably not the best use of our time, given where we are right now and given our strength. I think if, if people do want to pursue it, I certainly don't think it'll be disastrous. And I do think that at some point down the road or in the future, 
we should think about um, ways in which we can incorporate this as part of building DSA as like an institution in a civil society that's totally hollowed out and, and decayed. Thank you. And I think that's where we'll leave it. We're right at 8.30. Again, I want to thank you, Bashkar, so, so much for being so generous with your time this evening. I've really enjoyed um, hearing um, the discussion. And I also just want to do a quick plug for Jacobin. I've been a Jacobin subscriber since last year. I've been halfway through the issue. Um, it's truly one of, it's probably the most beautiful magazine ever. <laughs> I just think it looks great. I also really just love your theming. You guys do a really good job with your YouTube channel. I love weekends. Um, and uh, so I want to get that plug in for you, but there's anything you'd like to plug before we finish up, please feel free. No, that's it. Thank you so much for all of your, your work. And uh, yeah, I, I hope to make it down to, uh, to Indiana soon. Like honestly, after all these months of just being not quite alone in my apartment. I'm here with my, my fiance. Those things she's like kind of getting sick of my company. Like I would, <laughs> I would have a beer with anyone. Like I'm sure you all are a great company, but even if you weren't like, like I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm down to travel across the country meeting every single BSA member. So that's, that's 2022. That sounds great, man. And hopefully by then, um, uh, we'll have the spare bedroom ready here at my house. And right. if you come, you can stay with me. All, All right, right, I'll whoever. pick you up on it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank All you right. guys so much. All right, take care.